Hi, welcome, Happy New Year, and, and thanks, Carrie, for inviting me today. So my talk today is when food met pharma, delivery strategies for nutraceuticals. And there's gonna be some words in this initially that people are like, oh, nutraceutical, what is it? I'm gonna explain it, and you're gonna love it by the end of it, trust me. So the reason why I'm here today, I am one of the 175 faces of chemistry, um, and I was also lucky enough to win a, a competition with the Royal Society of Chemistry previously, because I love science communication. I'm great at doing stuff in the lab, but there's no point me spending all that money doing lots of expensive research if people don't know what we're doing. And a lot of the interesting stuff that we're doing doesn't get communicated well enough, and that's why th things like this today are so important. People coming out and talking about research and what we're doing. So I'm heavily involved in science communication. I've been involved in national and international competitions. I've been involved with the Royal Society of Chemistry and the American Chemical Society, but we'll say no more about that. <laughs> and I like to talk about my research, which is in nutraceuticals. I completed my degree in nutraceuticals in 2012, and I've been doing my research since 2013 in University College Dublin. So I'm a food scientist that studies pharmacology in the School of Veterinary Medicine. And if you can follow that link, that's fantastic, because I can't really. So I look at different health components. So particularly, I look at small protein fragments and how they can lower blood pressure. And nine million people die every year due to complications of high blood pressure. So it's a pretty big deal. So if we can work on ways of lowering this using foods, that's fantastic. So some people may know the reference of this talk, when food met pharma, and it's a link to When Harry Met Sally, the 1989 movie, which I've never seen, but I'm assured it's fantastic. <laughs> but I do know the really famous scene from it, where Meg Ryan's character in Cat's Deli is screaming, yes, yes, yes. And then the lady at the table next to her turns and says, I'll have what she's having. And that's how food and pharma should see each other. They shouldn't be working in silo, doing what they do, ending similar reach goals. They're, one's looking to improve health and one's looking to feed and improve health. So there's similar goals in mind, so they shouldn't be working in silo. And there's a lot of times when food has fed into pharma and pharma has fed into food. So we need to keep that in mind and think, I'll have what she's having. And that's how research should be conducted. So this is another great example. We'll pretend Trump is pharmaceuticals and lady is food. They work together and they've provided fantastic things. Penicillin, bread mold, uh, aspirin from tree bark, taxol for breast cancer from trees. So loads of things have come from nature originally. And the pharmaceutical industry saw these, used them, and people's lives have been better because of that. So what's to say the food isn't the next big wave of molecules that are gonna help you live all healthier, happier lives? And if that works, I'm happy because that's the area I work in. And maybe someday I'll be famous and wealthy, but we'll see. So I'm gonna go through nutraceuticals. So this is a really colorful slide and these are all nutraceuticals. Pretty much everything in food these days, unless it's bad for you, is probably a nutraceutical. I'm going to explain the difficulties of taking these tablets or these nutraceuticals and how we can overcome these using things like nanoparticles and absorption enhancers. So nutraceuticals are any food or isolated food component which provides a health benefit beyond basic nutrition. So basic nutrition, we're talking about proteins, fats and carbohydrates. Proteins are broken down into amino acids and they make up your muscles. Fats and carbohydrates are used for metabolism. So if you've no energy, somebody tells you to eat something with sugar in it. So they are just purely for nutritive purpose. But these nutraceuticals, they're amazing. They can do so much. Now, sometimes people overarch and, you know, they're not going to cure cancer tomorrow. If you eat an orange, you still may get sick. But they have some things in them that may be potentially helpful for health. So these can be things like lowering blood pressure, like I work on. I know for a fact that this lowers blood pressure. There have been human trials that show that people who have moderately high blood pressure, you can lower this using these food components. They can lower inflammation. And the word that is thrown around all the time when it comes to these things, antioxidants. And most people don't actually know what an antioxidant is because we'll just throw it on the packaging. It's an antioxidant. People will buy it. It's great. It's a it's powerful antioxidant. It's a potent antioxidant. But antioxidant is something simply that binds to oxygen that's reactive. And those reactive oxygen species can cause damage to our cells and can eventually lead to mutations and can eventually cause cancer. 
but that's a lot of cans, ifs and buts. It doesn't always do that. And it has been shown that taking too many antioxidants is also detrimental to your health. So with everything, there's always a fine balance. So I've broken these down into four broad categories. They're easy to digest and you'll be able to follow it, I assure you. Fatty acids, most people know about them. Most people have had the pleasure or displeasure of taking a spoonful of cod liver oil. This was common in schools in earlier times and thankfully it doesn't exist anymore because if you've ever had a spoonful of cod liver oil, it is disgusting. It is acrid, it's horrible, it coats the inside of your mouth and you will not get rid of that flavour for a good while. And then we developed capsules and they still had a really bad aftertaste. <laughs> so in the last few years we've developed capsules with these fish oils that no longer have this horrible aftertaste. But why are we taking these fish oils? Well, omega-3 fish oils, and generally we're talking about omega-3s, they're, able to, they're very useful in brain development and normal brain function, and they're also anti-inflammatory. So win-win situation when it comes to these. But the problem is none of people take enough of the right fats. And even if you do take enough of these fats, you may not get them into your body. And that's why we're looking at ways of working on this to get them to the point where we want them so that they can do their job better. So if you're a vegetarian, you wouldn't be running down the road to get your cod liver oil. So recently, krill oil has come out, and then you can even use walnut oil. So there have been huge developments in this area, and that's really good because realistically, not everyone eats the same, not everyone wants to eat the same way as everyone. And as a food scientist and working in that area, you have to always be thinking about what people want. Because unlike pharmaceutical science, where we say, you have to take this, when it comes to food, People want to enjoy food. They want to take something because they want to do it. They choose, they self-prescribe, and we stand back and let them do it. Bioactive peptides is the area I work on. So these are amazing, these are fantastic. They can lower blood pressure, they can lower inflammation, and they come from sources like milk. And that's what I think is pretty cool. So milk, when it's broken down by bacteria and yogurt, produces these small fragments that can lower blood pressure. You can also find them in chicken muscle or fish muscle. So again, if you're a vegetarian, you may not be wanting to go down these routes and there's other sources. You can have seaweed peptides that are also effective. So if you find something with a protein in it these days and you break it up at the right point, you'll probably find it works somehow in some way, shape or form. We only recently discovered that mining these foods, we're finding a whole host of bioactive compounds. And also the really interesting one recently, is royal jelly. Royal jelly has been used for skincare for lots of really long time. But recently they found that there's a lot of these compounds in it. So people are going through this literally protein by protein and going, okay, we have protein X, chop it up loads of different ways. What does it do? Nothing. Okay, grand, next protein. But these are great and everything. Proteins are really easily digested and, you know, that's what we do. We eat protein, we digest it. So these peptides are fantastic, but if you take them, you're probably going to digest them. So we need to overcome that issue. Micronutrients are probably also as well known as the fatty acids. These include all your vitamins, vitamin A, B, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, uh, vitamin C, vitamin D, vitamin D2, vitamin D3, the list goes on. There's loads of them. There used to be a vitamin K. It's still sketchy of what people call it. And then you've got your micronutrients. And some of them are more popular, like we know iron is really important if you're anemic. And if you're anemic, you have to take that in. Then bones, then bones need calcium. We've heard it since we were kids. So we need to take calcium. But <laughs> only in the last couple of years did we realize, oh, we actually need to take vitamin D as well if we want to get the benefit from the calcium. But then my favorite element when it comes to this stuff, selenium. Selenium is the sexy element. Selenium is important in sperm generation. So if you don't have selenium, your swimmers won't swim. Simple as that. You'll have bad cells. And that shows you how something so small can be so vital to health. So you have to think about these sort of things. And that's what we do. And then the phytochemicals. And these are pretty much all the antioxidants. If they come from a plant, they get the name phytochemical, phyto plant. And these are the ones that allow you to drink that glass of red wine without feeling bad about it because it's good for you. You know, the person on the TV told me I was supposed to drink this red wine. It will, it will save me. 
Curcumin from turmeric, it gives that beautiful yellow color to any food you're using with it. That is actually really beneficial for health. Then you've beta carotene in carrots, you know, eat your carrots, you'll see better. Well, it's kind of true. It's a pro-vitamin, it's eventually turned into vitamin A, which is important in your vision. So all of these things, a lot of them have old wives' tales, but some of them actually turns out there is science behind it. But we have to separate that and realize what's pop science and what's actual hardcore science. Because realistically, we don't want you wasting your money. I want you to take something that's beneficial for you, especially if I'm talking about it, because I want good science. So there's the four groups of nutraceuticals. But delivering something orally, it seems straightforward. You go to the pharmacy, you get your pill, you take it, you get better. But the work that goes into making sure that that pill works, you would not believe. <laughs> we have so many barriers when it comes to popping something in your mouth for it to work. Initially, you're going to have bioaccessibility and solubility issues, big words. Um, bioaccessibility, I don't know why it needs to be such a big word, it just means how easily the compound gets out from whatever it's in. It could be a food, it could be a pill, it could be a microparticle. Solubility is how easily it's going to be solubilized in your gastrointestinal tract. Most of the time, hopefully, your gastrointestinal fluid is going to be mainly water. Sometimes it's going to have alcohol in it, and that's fine, I'm not here to judge. Sometimes it's going to have a lot of fat in it. Again, not my call, you do you. But that is going to affect how soluble these compounds are and how much they can get into your bloodstream. Degradation and metabolism, our body is there to break things down. It doesn't like big things coming down the track. It wants to chop them down and use them up. That's what its purpose is. Sees a protein, it eats it up, builds new things. Fats, breaks them down, sends the different parts different ways. So our body is there to break these things down. So if we're like, okay, cool, I've got this really bioactive compound, it's gonna lower blood pressure, it's gonna stop inflammation. Your body doesn't care. It's just gonna see, I break down this bond, I do this, and that is all it does. It just turns over the same reaction time after time again. And then you have intestinal permeation, and that's the big one. That's how much of this can get across your intestinal wall into the bloodstream. And if it doesn't get into the bloodstream, it's probably not worth the curse. And that's the problem. You can spend all this time, you can make the best thing. It's super soluble, it's super active. It doesn't break down, but if it doesn't get across your cell walls into your bloodstream, it's probably not gonna work. And therefore we have strategies to overcome all of these. So this is confusing and it's meant to be confusing. It's not easy. There's a lot going on. You have enzymes, you have water balance, you have permeability across mucus and tissue. So it's not a straightforward one size fit all solution. We have to make sure that we take a specific thing and try to overcome those issues. And that's the problem. So many things have come on the market. So many things have come out that are gonna save you. They're gonna make you live a long, joyful, happy life. You'll become wealthy when you take it. But it's not gonna work if you don't look at each of these things. And that's the problem. I can go down to the health food store and I can buy maybe 25 to 30 different bottled compounds. Will they work? Probably not. And if they don't have a health claim written on the top of them, nobody's proven that they can work in people. So if it doesn't say anything on it, I'd be a bit skeptical. And I spent a lot of time reading this, so I'd be very skeptical about a lot of these things. So solubility is an issue, metabolism's an issue, and permeability is an issue. And you see that each of these has issues with two or more of them. So you're already on a losing battle, but that's why people do PhDs for the fun of it. And we like to overcome barriers and spend our time sitting in the lab trying to figure out how can I get this more soluble in oil? So I'm going to give you some examples of nanoparticles. So nanoparticles are very all the rage at the moment. They're super cool. They are the size of a grain of rice, shrunk down a hundred times, then shrunk down another hundred times and then just for good measure, shrink it down another 100 times. And that's the size we're talking about. It makes it really difficult when somebody hands you a vial and say, will you test these for me? And you're like, I don't really know that something's in there, but I'm trusting your judgment. I'm trusting you did the analysis that there is something in here. And it's one of those things, sometimes science is a bit of make-believe and magic because we just have to trust that somebody made this properly. 
So if you have a fatty type compound like vitamin D, say you wanted to put in, you'd need a fat-based nanoparticle. So you can have these four ones here, for example, and each of these can be made up with other food components. So for nano emulsions, you can use egg lecithin. So that's eggs, the reason why you use them a lot in baking, is because in the yolk you have these lecithins that emulsify things. So you're able to put that in, and you'll get a nanoparticle if you stir it and use the right things. Nanoparticles aren't that complex, <laughs> they sound it, but you can find mayonnaises that actually have nano emulsions because mayonnaise is literally oil in water emulsion. It's nothing more complex than that, but it tastes fantastic. And liposomes are similar, you'll find them in food. All these things are naturally found in food anyway because it's just the easiest way for the food to be made. But if you have a water-based compound, you're like, oh, okay, well, you could stick it in here, but it's tricky because you have to stick the water compound and then wrap it around, and then you have to put the fatty compound in. So you'd use water-based ones. <coughs> the water-based ones aren't as sleek, they're not as fancy, they're not as popular, and they tend to be a bit uglier. If you look at these under a really fancy, expensive microscope, a scanning electron microscope, the oil-based ones tend to be beautifully perfect droplets. And the protein-based ones tend to be jagged and rocky and not very pleasant to look at. But they still work. And at the end of the day, that's all we're looking for, is we're looking for things to work. So you can have polyelectrolyte complexes or hydrogels or protein polysaccharide things, and they're all basically similar. They have a carbohydrate or a protein, and they fold it in on themselves, and they've contained something inside it. And that's all any of these things generally are, one thing wrapped around another to help it. But do they work? Well, this is coenzyme Q10. If you go to a health food store, you'll be able to see coenzyme Q10. It's really popular. Has it got any proven health benefits? Depends who you ask. <laughs> if you ask European Food Safety Authority, they'll say no. <laughs> so it has no proven cause and effect relationship but we know that it is required for cellular metabolism. So it is a very important prerequisite for cells to make energy. If that isn't there, cells don't make energy as well, therefore you will have less energy. And it's found in tissues like the heart and the liver and the kidneys that do a lot of work. So the liver in some people does a lot more work than others. So depending on the tissue, it needs this. But it's very hard to prove that it works because energy output is very much like, do you feel like you have more energy today? Yeah, a bit. But you can't really, quant you can't say, oh, that's a 10. They have loads of energy today. So it makes it a bit more tricky to understand. But we can see how much of it gets into the blood. So this is an example of a nanoparticle. So this here is a liposome, I think. No, it's a nano emulsion. So it's a nano emulsion, and this is a really cool nanoparticle because it's pretty much made solely from salmon. I know, a bit weird. It's salmon oil with the coenzyme Q10 put inside, and then it's emulsified using salmon skin, which I think is pretty cool. <laughs> so it's basically a fish particle, but it has no fishy flavor or smells. So that's pretty cool. This is where we've come. This is what science and technology has brought us to. So this fishy particle is really good. So if you look here, this is, this is coenzyme Q10 in water, coenzyme Q10 in oil, and then in our particle. And this is in a rat, how much of it got from the mouth into the bloodstream. So it obviously works. It's getting into the bloodstream. But does that mean the rat had more energy? Don't know. It wouldn't really answer. So it's really tricky to figure it out. And that's the problem with some of these things. They may do things, but they may do them really, really subtly. So it's hard to figure out whether anything's actually working. But we do know from this that if you stick inside a fish particle, you will get more of it into the bloodstream. So if we find something that's a big hit, we know that we can stick it in this type of particle and it will get into the bloodstream. And it could be something that allows us to figure out, does it work? So a better example, resveratrol. So this is a thing in wine that allows you to drink it and not feel bad. The tannins are also a thing that people will talk about. So resveratrol has been like talked about for a good few years. For a while, people were like, drink wine every night, it will save your life. Many people's livers would really, really disagree because obviously there's a lot of ethanol. Um, so resveratrol is really interesting. It's quite small. Structurally, I'd look at that and go, grand, shouldn't have any issues with that. It's small, what could be the problem? It doesn't like to solubilize in water. 
fine. Most of these don't like to solubilize in water. It doesn't like to solubilize in fat. And that's when you have an issue. <laughs> so it doesn't solubilize in water at all. It hardly solubilizes in fat. So that goes, throws both of our strategies out the window. The one thing it does like to be solubilized in, ethanol, alcohol. And that's the reason why you find it in wine, other than the fact that it's made from grapes. So it solubilizes really well in ethanol. And that's the reason why you actually do need a glass of wine and a glass of this in water won't do you any good. And that's the justification I've given myself based on the science. So resveratrol is really cool. It is anti-inflammatory, but it's a really good anti-inflammatory compound. It has been shown to reduce the incidence of colorectal cancer in animals. And there was recently a trial done with humans and they showed that it reduced the um, incidence of cells that showed that they would become cancerous. So this is one of those that you're like, okay, wow, this actually could be something. And this is where pharma will stick their head up and go, interesting, a compound that could work. And that's cool because realistically, if it works, that's awesome. It could help people in the future. So this is an example of a nanoparticle to help solubilize resveratrol. Because if you put it in water, you'll see on this black line here, it will do nothing. It won't go into solution. It will literally sit at the bottom of the beaker or the flask or the glass. If you put it in a solution, so a bit of ethanol, a bit of water, a bit of oil, you'll get a bit more into the bloodstream of the animal if you give it to them orally. If you pop it in this particle here, it shoots up and you get this prolonged effect, which is awesome. If you're looking at inflammation, you want a slow release of things over time. You don't want a big burst of anti-inflammatories. If you get a big burst of anti-inflammatories, that will take away your pains in your joints for about a minute or two. And then for the rest of the day, when it gets colder specifically, it will hurt a lot more. So this particle was made from corn, which I think is cool again. <laughs> So it's made from corn protein, and most proteins tend to have both fat-loving and water-loving parts of them. But this is really interesting because this really hates water. So this made a particle that was both really fat-loving on the inside, but also suitable for resveratrol to st solubilize inside. And that's why we saw such, well, they saw, I didn't do this. They saw such good results. So they were able to find a particle that fit it perfectly. And that's what the problem is. You can't just pick one thing and say, we'll, tr we'll throw it in there. They found something that worked for that compound. Other people have tried resveratrol in particles. Hasn't been that successful. This was able to reduce the incidence of inflammation um, in a mouse model. And the mouse model, basically, they it's not very pleasant, but they induce inflammation using a polysaccharide. And then when they gave them this over a prolonged period, they reduced that and they were able to show a clear distinction between animals that were getting these edemas, which would eventually form into cancer, than animals that weren't. So it's really effective. So we'll see where this goes in the future. And then you've the good old favorite. If you ever walk into any cafe and you'll see people sipping on green tea, and green tea is fantastic, isn't it? Green tea is anti-inflammatory. It's good for detoxing. It's all these fantastic things. Does it work? The data doesn't suggest it. There are compounds in it that are really good, like EGCG. If I gave you its full name, I wouldn't be able to pronounce it. You wouldn't follow it, and because I'd spend about 10 minutes trying to pronounce it. So it is found in green tea. But if you want to get the beneficial effects of this, I would suggest you sit there and eat bags and bags and bags of green tea leaves, not green tea. <laughs> so you put your green tea leaves in, you get this, to some people, pleasant drink. But you're getting, you can even look at it, look how green this is and look at the color of your green tea. It's quite clear, you can see through it and there's a bit of a green tinge off it. This is green as heck, like it's really green. <laughs> So it's because of how its chemical structure is. It's got loads of conjugation in it, which means it's really colorful. And if you were getting loads of that into your green tea, it might work. And that's why matcha tea potentially could have more in it. But this compound is really good, again, as an anti-inflammatory. But in a different way to resveratrol, which could be used for cancer, this could be used for people who are pre-diabetic or pre-obese. 
So in those situations, you have your cells that are they're motoring along, they're doing their thing, but they have low grade inflammation the whole time. So it's not inflammation that a doctor would potentially notice because it's not inflamed and causing issues, but it's slowly secreting inflammatory signs. And it's saying, I'm inflamed, but like secretly inflamed. And this is what causes and leads to the development of some of these diseases. It exacerbates the development. So if you have this low grade inflammation, it will slowly creep along and make it worse. So how do you fix that? Stop the low grade inflammation. And this T. cacachin, or EGCG, is able to do that. It's not the best anti-inflammatory, but it's really good at stopping low-grade inflammation. So because it's water-soluble, it's never going to look as impressive compared to the lipid-solid ones. The fatty ones, because your gastrointestinal fluids are water pretty much, you don't get that big jump that you see with the water. The water ones, they're going to solubilize really easily. So you don't get that huge jump and it doesn't look as dramatically impressive, but it's impressive, trust me. So you get this release over a longer period of time, up to eight hours, up to like almost 10 hours of that slow release. And that's what you want. You don't want this burst. You want it to slowly trickle away, stopping a bit of inflammation every now and then. And that's what they did. And this nanoparticle, crab shell. All these nanoparticles are cool. This is made from a long sugar found in crab shell called chitin and they just change, modify it slightly and it gives you chitosan and it's also found in mushrooms. So they got this and they wrap it around the um, tea um, compound and they were able to get this particle that released really nicely and slowly. And that's cool because if you can do that, you can then design a nanoparticle that behaves how you want it to behave. For this type of syndrome, you want slow release, you don't want loads of it all at once. So you want something that you can design to do that specifically. And that's often what carbohydrates give you that proteins sometimes don't because proteins will get eaten up by enzymes anyway. So we've overcome solubility, which is a huge problem. And you've protected them from metabolism, which is a huge problem. But getting across this, the gastrointestinal tract, that's where the battle really comes out. So you've Mucus, mucus, can't be that difficult, right? Mucus is equivalent to climbing through loads of nets that slowly but slowly the netting gets tinier and you just will not get through. It's designed to stop things getting through and it works really, really well. But the problem is we want things to get across the mucus and certain things are allowed. If you're a water-based compound, you'll probably slip through if you're small. But if you're a protein or a peptide, it's going to get stuck here and it's not really going to go anywhere. And then eventually this mucus is turned over. It's literally, there's two layers of mucus. One's called the sloppy layer. It's a delightful name. <laughs> and that turns over about every 40 minutes. So there's nothing stuck there too long. Because if it was stuck there too long, your gut would get really, really toxic really, really quickly. Because realistically, this is like stick in the mud if you were a kid. You're going to stay there for ages. And if you're toxic, you need to get it out quickly. So that's what the sloppy layer does. It sticks to things, gets rid of them. Sticks to things, gets rid of them. But we have ways over this. So if you get across the mucus barrier using a mucolytic, you then have to get across these cells. They look harmless. They're one cell thick. How difficult could it be? It's quite difficult, I'm not going to lie. So you can go through the cell, which seems like an okay solution. There might be certain things that will help you get across the cell. But inside those cells, waiting in the bushes, are enzymes that are going to gobble up your compounds. And you think, great, I got into the cells. They will not come out of the cells. And if they do, they will be in individual pieces and no longer have any bioactivity. And there goes your hopes of developing a heart medication for the future. But you can go in between the cells. So these cells are really tightly packed together. But they have these things called tight junctions. And if you manage to open those junctions slightly, you could slip through. Now, it's not a problem for fat-based compounds because the cells generally have a fat layer around them. So they'll slip through anyway because fat likes fat. And it will be like, cool, go through. But if your water is soluble and you got through the mucus and you thought you'd have made you're going to get stuck here unless you do something to those tight junctions. 
And that's where the fun with food and pharmaceuticals is currently happening. These nanoparticles have been around a while and a lot of people are making them. You'll find maybe 100 to 200 publications on nanoparticles every month. But these things, less common and that's what makes them cooler. Papayas, they're tasty, they're yummy. Or pineapples, they're also pleasant to eat. But they have an enzyme in them that breaks down protein. And that's the reason why there was an incident of pineapple workers who didn't wear gloves losing their fingerprints. Because these enzymes slowly eroded away at their fingerprints, which meant it was really easy for them to rob banks because, you know, no gloves required. And um, papaya has the exact same thing in it. There are two different enzymes. One's called papain, which is in papaya, and in pineapple it's bromelain. And they both work the exact same way. They break up a cysteine bridge that's found in proteins. And that cysteine bridge is quite small, but it's very effective at keeping the structure of a protein. And if you break the structure of a protein at its beautiful level, it no longer works. It is ineffective. You've pulled that piece of string on that t-shirt and then the whole frayed edge comes out. And that's what these enzymes do. They sneak in, they eat away at it, and then they leave and they're like, ha ha ha. So these are really great for what they do. But then people start to think, okay, how can we use them? They have something beneficial. Surely we can exploit this. And the pharmaceutical industry is much better at doing that than the food industry at the moment. They made this nanoparticle. This one isn't that exciting. Unfortunately, it's not made from any super food. But they stuck the papaya enzyme on the outside. No, that was cool. So they stuck this papaya enzyme and they put it into some animals. And they said, OK, let's see what happens. And they found that most of the particles with this papaya enzyme on the outside stuck around in the small intestine. And that's awesome, because the small intestine is where all of that absorption for nutrients and nutraceuticals occurs. If you get further down, it's probably not going to happen. And then you'll get excreted, but that's for another day. Um, if you're too high up, it's really acidic and there's still a lot of enzymes present. The jejunum is where you want to be. The jejunum is the coolest place in town if you're a nutraceutical. You want to be there because you want to get absorbed. So if you're able to get these papaya enzymes stuck to the outside of a particle and break that mucus down for a little while, it will make it a bit watery, but it turns over quickly so there's no real health implications, you'll be able to get them closer to the cell wall so they'll get into the bloodstream. So that's really cool. Is it effective? Well, we haven't seen it past a rat, so we'll see. But mucolytics aren't new. A lot of people have been using bromelain and papain for cystic fibrosis. Cystic fibrosis, you get a huge buildup of mucus in your lungs. So they, you normally give them a mucolytic, which will break this down. So they're just saying, OK, well, we could do that and try to use it to get things into the bloodstream better. And that's what people are starting to look at. And it's more translational with saying, well, something works over there. Why can't we try that? And these, a lot of these components, and one of the big things for cystic fibrosis is N-acetylcysteine, which you can also buy in your health food shop. So it's a food supplement, and it works if you give it to somebody with cystic fibrosis to break down mucus. So it also works to break down mucus in the gastrointestinal tract. So that's cool and everything. But how about those tight junctions? So this here is a very simplistic graph Whoever made it is obviously awesome because it's my graph. So this is a measure of the electrical resistance of jejunum. So jejunum is the place we want to be. It's in the small intestine. So we take some normal tissue and we see it, ha it keeps pretty consistent. Its electrical resistance is good. But what's the electrical resistance mean? Well, if we open those tight junctions and we slip them open slightly, we'll see that the electrical resistance will drop. So we know that we're opening them. So if we put in a fatty acid, fatty acids are everyone's friends these days, it opens these junctions enough, enough to let stuff through. So it brings it down and these will close again over time. And the fatty acid is found in dairy because obviously I work with milk peptides and I also work with milk fatty acids. Who doesn't love milk? Lactose intolerant people, that's who don't. <laughs> So this fatty acid makes up about 8% of the fatty acids in dairy. And it's really, it works. There's companies that are currently using this from a pharmaceutical point of view. They're using it for insulin, I think. Nova Nordisk, look them up. It's pretty interesting stuff. But we're thinking, if we're able to open it just enough, we'll be able to get these nutraceuticals across that don't want to go across. 
And this has been effective with another company in the pharmaceutical industry. So everything else up until this point has been my wonderful friends, nutraceuticals. So this is an example of a pharmaceutical. So agromegaly is a disease that leads to giantism. And the best example of that is if anyone's seen James Bond with jaws in it, he had agromegaly. He still does have agromegaly. So it's not curable, unfortunately, but it is treatable. So what happens is in agromegaly, you have no control over growth hormone. Growth hormone goes absurdly out of control. People tend to be about seven foot plus. The hands will tend to grow quite large, but there is a peptide that works at treating this. It inhibits growth hormone, but peptides get broken down. Peptides don't like to cross the intestinal tract. Peptides have loads of issues. But if you use one of these fatty acids, just a slightly smaller one than the one in um, dairy, you're able to get this increase into the blood. And this means that this drug has just passed phase three clinical trials. And this will mean that instead of having a once monthly injection that takes, I think about an hour with a really large gauge needle and tends to have really bad swelling, they'll be able to take two pills a day. So it just shows you the fatty acids are more than they're made out to be. And they have this potential as permeation enhancers to open up those tight junctions. But it's not just fatty acids. Spicy food does it. Alcohol does it. So that's fantastic. Great news. <laughs> but we can't simply go around giving a wonderful nutraceutical in pure alcohol. I think a lot of people would have issues with that. I'm pretty sure the food and health authorities would definitely have issues with it. But the components in spicy food do very similar thing. They're able to open these tight junctions just enough to let stuff across. And this happens normally when you eat spicy food. So we're able to find the exact compound that does that, caspasin, and we're able to use it to help open those tight junctions. So at the moment, food is a really interesting area. We have so much that we could do, but we need to learn from pharma. And pharma has a lot it can do, but it needs to take learnings from food. It's not a one size fit all solution and neither can live in silo. And that's where we need to be working together. And that's when food met pharma. Thank you. <laughs> Questions. We have roving microphones apparently, almost. Oh, we have a question straight away. Awesome. Thank you for that really interesting um, presentation. You mentioned about diabetes. Um, the treatment for you mentioned, is it applicable to both type 2 and type 1 diabetes? Um, no. So it's for, um, so if you're, if you're born with diabetes, unfortunately not. Um, so it's more for, so when we're talking about nutraceuticals, we're generally looking at prevention rather than a cure. And that is one very distinct thing about nutraceuticals. You can't claim to be a medication or to treat a disease, but you can prevent the onset of certain risk factors to it. So for things like that, you can prevent the low grade inflammation that could lead to exacerbation of things that could cause, that will lead to diabetes. So it's not as something that you'll ever say, take this food pill, it will fix this disease. Take this food pill. You can, and that's the thing, we don't want to do that. That's the pharmaceutical industry, that's their niche. We're trying to prevent diseases. And that's what we're looking to do with these components is prevent onsets of diseases. Here's uh, two questions. The roving microphones are en route. Uh, uh, two questions, if I may. Uh, yep. The first one is um, both um, uh, resveratrol and the green tea compound uh, have got um, a few hydroxy groups as functional groups. Is that significant in their activity or possible activity? Shall I give you the second one straight Yeah, go ahead. Uh, the second one then is that there must be a, a set number of possible combinations for tripeptides. So if it's not already being done, surely the simplest thing would be just to synthesize the whole lot and screen the whole lot. Yep. Not, not just wait on the natural ones. Thank you. So resveratrol and um, EGCG. So their chemical composition, this is the problem a lot of the time with food research. Um, they don't tend to go in and take a systematic approach the same way if you were developing a small molecule
pharmaceutical because there's not generally the same implications. So they've got a history of use in people, so we know that there's not going to be health implications. Nobody's going to get necessarily sick from them. But they don't necessarily look at what is causing the beneficial effect. So the low-grade inflammation is due to the um, um, conjugation because it's an antioxidant. Um, when it comes to the, um, the hydroxyl groups, no idea. <laughs> Possibly. But I don't think there's the same systematic approach put to it. Um, and when it comes to tripeptides, yeah, people have done it. <laughs> they will literally look at, um, say, a beta casein from milk. They will look at the whole string of amino acids and they will chop up every and they will synthesize every part of it and go, OK, what works? And it's called um, mining for bioactives. It's quite a, I think some with little hats and pickaxes and they have found certain ones. But then that begs the question, is that food derived? Because you've you've taken a food protein and you've broken it up possibly with something that wasn't naturally there. IPP, for example, was, was found because it was broken down from the milk protein because of enzymes and bacteria that were in the yogurts and in the milk drinks. So we know that a food component, it is food derived. But if you take something, then you're just fishing it out and that would be more farmer's thing. So they could look at it similar how they took um, aspirin and things like that and they could then modify it. But if you modify it, it's no longer a food component. So there's a really cool example of EPA, one of the fatty acids, an Irish company actually, they um, put in ethylene or esterification on it. And that's now um, as a medication for um, really high triglycerides. I've that and that mic's gone again, I think. Um, so you can be prescribed this, but it's no longer a food component, but it has its origins in food. So it's kind of, and that's again where food, ha food could be the next big wave of molecules for treating diseases. Thank you, very interesting. Um, I work in education, my students tend to think they're immortal, their diet is appalling. Uh, we're very worried about it. Uh, is there a case for treating students with these compounds, almost with their daily milk? Um, well, I don't think I get ethical approval to go into your school and do it. Um, but that's why food fortification has become a thing. So um, a lot of um, milks now will have vitamin D added in that wasn't necessarily, there might have been some vitamin D, um, but they've added vitamin D and added calcium because of the fact that in UK and Ireland and in the higher area of the world, we have really poor exposure to sunlight. So we have chronically deficient vitamin D. So they added these into diet and similar things have happened with flour. They fortify flour with certain things. So that's the thing the, the food and safety authorities in each country have to make those decisions, however. So we are blanketed by the European Food Safety Authority and we kind of take our leanings from them. If they say, yes, go ahead, we're allowed to do something. But you can't necessarily go around fortifying everything. A lot of people don't like the fact that water has fluoride in it, for example. Well, there's a particular reason. I work with children with psychiatric problems, and their diet is particularly poor, and their problems are particularly in extreme, and we do worry about their diet. I guess maybe in those c cases it might be justified, but presumably a lot more research would need to be done. Mm. No, and that's the thing. Food fortification has huge benefits for the end user. Like folic acid, again, was another thing that people really never thought about until they linked certain things. And that's when those links come with these food components. That's when it really can be effective and when actions are taken and put in place. Thank you. Just, just following on from this gentleman's question, how would you see things panning out for, for example, type 2 diabetes prevention? That everybody takes a pill every day for this because to be on the safe side and then a pill for something else and a pill for something else. So really best practice is you take a couple of dozen sherbets every day just in case. <laughs> Um, no, it is a really interesting concept. So we can talk about all of these things um, till the cows come home, effectively, and we say, okay, take this to prevent oxidation, like cancer, this for your blood pressure, this. But it's always, um, the one thing is consumers will always make their own decisions. 
there, and that's the problem. Um, so we can have this information in place, but it, when it comes to this, I think it's more about giving people the correct information. And there's a lot of misinformation when it comes to a lot of these nutraceuticals. A lot of people think they do lots of things that they don't actually do, and a lot of people think they don't do anything, but you can see they do do something. So, and I think that's where it comes down to. From a food point of view, dispelling misinformation is far more powerful than saying you take this pill for this and this pill for that and allowing people to design their lifestyle as they see fit. I think we're good. Oh. I practically never enter a health food shop and I'm deeply suspicious of everything they contain. Am I wrong? And if I do, how should I sort out the sheep from the goats? <laughs> that is the problem. Um, a lot of people are sceptical, and I think when it comes to this, sometimes being sceptical is a lot better. I would generally recommend a healthy dose of scepticism over a lot of these things. Because um, if you take everything they say, they can actually be quite bad for you. So if you take certain things, it could be binding to other things. Like a lot of these things will affect drug interactions. So if you're on statins, for example, for a heart condition, they could be interacting with these, but nobody knows. And then you could go into cardiac arrest because of these. So there's so much unknown, unfortunately. So the best cause if to know how to sort out things is to listen to the representative food authorities. So EFSA is realistically, for a European point of view, they are very strict. There have been, I think there have been over a couple of thousand cases applied for health claims to say that we can do this with this compound. I think there's about 60 to 80 that have health claims. And a lot of these are things like calcium and fiber. <laughs> so things that you know work. And EFSA is good at that, they're strict. If you go over to America, the FDA has a health claim for soy. We don't. If you go over to Japan, Foshu, which is their functional food for specific health uses, that has a health claim for soy. So it depends where you are. So sometimes it's listening to the person who is more skeptical and EFSA tend to be skeptical unless you show conclusively with 150 people, we gave them this and something happened. So that's why I would listen to them rather than others. We good? No? Hi. Would there be scope to develop nanoparticles which could target nutraceuticals to specific tissues? Yep. So if you took vitamin B, for example, or certain, there are certain receptors in different parts of the body and you could pop, say, vitamin B on the outside and then that will attach to that part of the body. So that's what a lot of people are looking at for chemotherapeutics because obviously with chemotherapeutics, you don't want to lash something into the body and let it take its course because they're quite detrimental to health, although they have hugely beneficial effects. So that's where a lot of nanoparticles currently are looking at the moment of a specific targeted release. So a lot of the ones I talked about today, once they get past the gastrointestinal tract, um, past, sorry, the gastric system, so once they release into the duodenum and the jejunum, they tend to burst open, which is what you want because that's where you get the absorption. So other people are looking at putting specific things on the outside that will target. So yeah, it's a huge area at the moment for chemotherapeutics specifically. But not for food. Done. Thank you all for attending. I hope you learned something and enjoyed yourself at least.